When I first heard about the SDGs, 2030 seemed so far in the future. But of course it's not. A millennial who's 25 this year will be just confronting what it means to be 40 in 2030. This discussion will zero in on some key elements that need change, even transformation. If that 25-year-old anywhere in the world, woman or man, will find more and equal opportunities, as speakers today and tomorrow will illustrate, gender equality is both a sustainable development objective and a solution. We'll hear from the doers who will highlight from their experience how the women's empowerment principles provide a ready-made platform to scale up business action on equality and empowerment and help achieve the new SDGs as well. Uh, we also look forward to hearing from you and the virtual audience uh, that joins us. Uh, presenting the economic background data is Ms. Quaylen Elmgrud, partner at McKinsey & Company, who leads the company's work on the power of parity, how advancing women's equality can add 12 trillion. The number is stupendous. 12 trillion to global growth. This influential report identified 10 impact zones and importantly linked economic equality to social equality. Quaylen, welcome. Hello, Excellencies, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you some of the research that we've done over the last 10 years. McKinsey has invested heavily in the space of women in the workplace and women in society. We're also a proud champion of the women empowerment principles, so we're happy to be here to celebrate that with you today. The insights that I'm gonna share with you over the next few minutes stem from two pieces of work that we've done, in fact, just in the past six months. The first is McKinsey Global Institute's work on the power of parity, and the second piece of work is our partnership with Lean In on women in the workplace. Uh, and over the last six months, there's five specific insights that I wanna share with you today. The first uh, is the $12 trillion, and a couple of you have heard that already referenced today. Let me talk you through this $12 trillion number. And is it a realistic number? And we think yes. Let me tell you how we got to that number. We took a look at three things in terms of women's participation in the workplace. Those three things are over there on the right side. First of all, are women working or not? The second piece, uh, and these two second pieces are elements that were not really covered uh, in a lot of other models that we'd looked at. The second piece was part-time versus full-time mix. Women tend to work in more part-time roles. Uh, and the third piece was really sector mix. Uh, women tend to work more in services sectors, lower productivity sectors on average. And when women match men on all three of those factors, that total opportunity is actually $28 trillion. That's the size of the economy of the US and China, $28 trillion. We didn't think that was a realistic number to achieve over the next 10 years. And so we set about thinking about what would be a realistic number. And to do that, we looked historically and we said, what is the best rate of improvement of countries in a particular region. So we clustered uh, countries around the world into 11 regions and we said, let's match the empirical rate of improvement over the last 10 years. And let's say every country in a region matches that regional best, what we're calling a best in region, a best in neighborhood sort of scenario. And that's what gets us to about 40% of the opportunity or $12 trillion. So when you hear that $12 trillion, it's really, can you match the best regional performer uh, on those three elements. So for example, in Western Europe, that would be matching Spain's rate of improvement. Uh, in Latin America, that would be matching Chile's rate of improvement. So that's insight number one in terms of the $12 trillion. And as you see from the right-hand side there, about 60% of the opportunity, that $12 trillion, is from workforce participation, and 20 and 20% from that part-time mix, and 20% from the sector mix. That's insight number one. 
Insight number two is no country can capture their share of the $12 trillion unless you work on the societal barriers that are holding women back from participating more fully in the workplace. So we looked across 95 different countries. Each dot on this chart is a different country. Over 95% of global GDP, over 95% of women in the world. Uh, and we created a score called GPS, the Global Parity Score. A simple number between zero and one one being perfect equality, zero being perfect inequality. Uh, and we said on the x-axis, what is your score, the country's score, in terms of equality in society? And on the y-axis, what's your score in terms of equality in work? And what you see here is a strong relationship between the two. In other words, your country cannot capture your share of the $12 trillion unless you're tackling the barriers uh, to societal equality as well. Insight number three is that there's 10 impact zones. An impact zone, as we define it, is a combination of a geographic area and an issue. So issue, geography, combinations. These are the 10 impact zones that impact over 80% of the world's women. There were five global impact zones. In other words, there is no country around the world that's doing a great job on the five global impact zones. And there were five regional impact zones, which are more targeted issues for particular areas. So the first one we just talked about, blocked economic potential. That's the 12 trillion we were just discussing. Unpaid care work, there's been some discussion of that. We know globally women do around three, to three times as much unpaid care work as men. In some countries like India, it's almost 10 times as much unpaid care work as men. We also know that on a, on a global average, only about 60% um, of this work, well, 40% of this work is taking care of loved ones, children, the elderly, things that we would all value. About 60% of it is routine housework. So things like uh, in developing countries, getting access to clean water, uh, fuel, uh, and in developed countries, shopping or doing the laundry, things that, that we all wouldn't miss if it weren't here. Fewer legal rights, political underrepresentation, and violence against women. I heard many of you uh, quite surprised uh, when it was shared earlier that one in three had experienced violence against women. That actually is the global average. One in three women globally have experienced violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the same average that we experience here in the U.S. So it's an issue everywhere around the world. And then some of the regional impact zones in terms of educational levels in some areas, maternal health in sub-Saharan Africa, et cetera. So take this from a global level now down to an individual company. And we looked uh, across over 100 different Fortune 500 companies in the US uh, and surveyed over 30,000 employees. And this is the pipeline for women, talented women uh, within a company, the overall talent pipeline. And it starts, unfortunately, uneven, and it gets leakier as you get to more senior levels. So 45% of that starting funnel uh, is women which is surprising because actually the majority of valedictorians, the highest GPAs on average, were pulling from a talent pool that is, should be majority women, yet already at that first barrier into the Fortune 500 funnel, we've got some drop off. And that drop off continues across the full funnel, dripping down all the way to 17% in the C-suite. Uh, and while 17% is already a dire enough number, as you dig underneath the 17%, um, it's, even, it's even more stark. What we find is that women tend to have more staff roles, head of HR, head of finance, versus more line roles. And while those are excellent roles as well, typically the CEO role tends to pull more from the roles of leadership of running a big P&L or running a big business unit. Uh, we also find that women have more narrow uh, sponsorship networks, more female skewed networks, uh, and more junior networks. So that's been a challenge and, and one that we'd like to address uh, with this group. That's the fourth insight. And the fifth insight uh, is that there's a lot of successes to build on. We looked across over 115 different case examples, 75 different interventions, uh, and there were six broad themes, six categories that really emerged. You see them here, financial incentives and support, technology and infrastructure, creation of economic opportunities, capability building, attitudinal shaping, and laws, policies, and regulations. There's six categories. I think there's two insights, though, as we looked across all of the case examples of, of exciting impact. One was that the most successful case examples combined levers from each of these, not each, but a number of the six buckets. So they weren't 
a single lever solution to really make it stick and have impact. It was a couple of levers in combination. The other key trend that we saw that was quite exciting was that it was cross-sector collaboration. So governments collaborating with NGOs, collaborating, collaborating with the private sector, or at least two of those three were some of the uh, action items that we saw have real impact over time. So one example I would share with you is Belbajau in India. Um, which was a, a, an interesting collaboration to raise awareness of violence against women uh, and the passage of a law, which was a combination of a community activation organization with a PR firm, Ogilvy Mather, to spread awareness and, and raise celebrity endorsements, along with um, the public sector and, and the government actually getting out on airwaves and spreading this. And that reached millions of people to change mindsets and attitudes across both women and men. Let's take that now from broader cross-sector collaborations into individual companies. Here are some of the cutting-edge actions we've seen extremely consistent with the seven WEPs. Uh, you'll see actually almost uh, real alignment with number one and seven, but actually all of them are here. So demonstrating that diversity is a top priority from the CEO, CEO level on down. Tracking key metrics, driving accountability, not just at the top level, but cutting that by business unit, by geography, to understand where the funnel is leaky and where there are issues. Rethinking work, whether that is thinking through access to childcare and more supportive infrastructure, or job sharing and role sharing. Identifying and interrupting gender bias, a lot of unconscious bias training that we've seen across the most senior levels of the organization as well as throughout in terms of what qualifies for a promotion, how are we in our dynamics and talking in meetings. Uh, and the last is leveling the playing field. There's been some interesting work done on blind resume screening and what that does even to candidates coming into the funnel, uh, much less throughout. So those are some of the exciting actions that we've seen at the individual corporate level. So just to set the stage here, those were the five insights we wanted to share to kick off our panel. Number one, $12 trillion. Number two, you can't capture your share of the $12 trillion unless you address those societal gaps. Number three, there's 10 impact zones that, uh, that capture sort of 80 percent of the women in the world. Number four, it's going to take over 100 years to close that C-suite gap down to the 17% unless we take more active action. And number five, there's a number of successes to build on, particularly with cross-sector collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Quilin. It's so important for a company like McKinsey to be doing this deep dive into the numbers and scenarios and not lose sight of the need to change social norms and address systemic worldwide issues like ending violence against women, uh, which is key to unlocking the global economic div dividend that is so needed. 